Well, today we welcome Rodolfo. He will talk about recent developments and the Shaft Reddit conjecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let me, let me start. I will divide it off in, in three parts. So I'm sorry for Sebastian that has already heard this talk before. So I'm going to talk about the motivation in the first part. Then I'm going to talk about some general features. And I hope if the experts come, I will give some detail. If not, I promise to this part. Um, so everything I will say is going to be a, over the complex numbers. So now let me start with with one with motivation. So let me let me recall the uniformization theorem. So this is a theorem due to Poincaré, Cue. It was around 1907. And it says the following. So you take, let's see the a smooth projective curve, then its universal cover is either P1, C, or the unit B. Okay, so you can, if you know compact Riemann surfaces, well, this is a smooth projective curve in this, over the complex numbers. And then you look at the universal cover, like topologically, what is the maximal, the maximal cover? And then you will see that you have only three, uh, three chances to get, you can get Q1, the complex numbers of the, this, right? It's more or less clear. And, and so what this is telling you is that you can obtain a smooth projective curve as a quotient of some of these. And basically, a lot of geometry is, is uh, depending on which one is uniformizing. So you have elliptic curves, and elliptic curves have C as the universal cover, and you have curves of genus bigger than two, and the uniformization is neat. But, uh, so the question is, what about higher dimensions? And this question turns out to be very difficult because uh, already in dimension two, I'm talking complex dimension. Here is also again complex dimension one. You can have the product of the analytic disk times itself, right? And this is not going to be by holomorphic. So the unit ball in C2. So you have a ball, use the the numbers of absolute value less than one, and this is not by holomorphic. So topologically, it's the same. You can deform the product of two disks to a ball, right? But not you cannot do it in, in a by holomorphic way. And uh, but they both uniformize. Um, smooth projective surfaces. Of general type. So what is the meaning of this? So I was telling you, you can get a Riemann surface of genus two and higher as portion of the unit disk, okay? And so, I mean, for genus, Zero, you have this, for genus one, you have this, and for genus bigger than two, you have everything else. 
So this is called general type. You have a lot of a lot of varieties there, and so they are very wild. It's very difficult to study them. But I already mentioned two. You can have something that is the universal cover of something of called general type of these difficult families, and it's not only one thing. So you can get more. You can get actually a lot of things. So it's let's say in some sense hopeless to classify the the universal covers in higher dimension. So, so we you always start late, but when I'm coming late, you start late. <laughs> and so this, this is basic, and this is I started really basic. Okay. So I, I started with the Poincaré uniformization theorem, and then I explained something about dimension. Okay. Okay. So now let me go to, to this question of, of Safarevich. So remember, we are trying to, to generalize this. We are trying to get some, some properties of this in, in higher dimension. And this is in 70, 70 Shafarevich. Um, so let X be a complex projective manifold, this means smooth, then uh, is its universal cover holomorphically convex. So I'm going to define what it is. I just want to say that all these three spaces satisfy this, this property. They are holomorphically convex, and this is what it's called a Shaparevich conjecture, what we call the Shaparevich conjecture. There are other Shaparevich conjectures, but I'm going to be interested in this one, okay? You take a projective smooth variety and you, you look at the universal cover, and then you are asking some analytic question, as you, as you said. So the definition, let me give you a, a classical definition. This is not the definition we work with, but um, just to give you a flavor. So let X be a complex space, complex normal space. I'm saying technical words, you can think in a, in a manifold. So we say X is holomorphically convex if uh, for every compact, A inside X, the holomorphic convex school and this is defined as as follows. You take the points in the manifold such that when you take the absolute value of all functions, they are smaller than the supreme of this function in K for all holomorphic functions. And you ask that this should be compact. So if, if you never, if you have never seen something like uh, the convex hull, maybe it's, it's it's strange to see some kind of definition, right? But if you have seen like linear pool, linear convex pool, and something, you you do some inequalities, like to when you have the, the convex pool of some points, you take some convex subset that contains all the points. And so this is mimicking this this relation. You are using holomorphic functions to define another uh, another space and when you have a compact space. You want to obtain something compact, and this is the case you call this holomorphically complex. So let me give you a a trivial example. So let X be a compact manifold. Um, and then we take a compact 
inside x. So we wanna we wanna see what the convex hull of this is. But the holomorphic functions of x, these are constants because you are in a compact manifold and holomorphic functions in some in compact are only constants. So if you take this, the holomorphic, I don't know how to denote the mid of hull of k. So this is going to be everything. But this is compact. And this implies that x is holomorphically convex. All what I want to say here is if you start with something compact, you will obtain something holomorphically convex. And if you're in particular, P1 is holomorphically convex, but also CMD. Now, I don't want you to understand this really. Like this, just to give you an idea, let me give you more equivalent statements. Questions? And now, so let me continue with the definitions. So you have something stronger than holomorphically convex, and we have, I can, I can say it here. So let me take X, a complex manifold. X is called Stein if X is holomorphically convex and uh, it separates points. So for a holomorphic function separate points. So when you have two different points X, Y in a in the complex manifold, you will have two holomorphic functions such that um, the values at these points are different. So once again, you get something Stein if you if the manifold is holomorphically convex. And if you have two points, there exist two functions that takes different values on them. Okay? And we call we call such a such a variety a Stein. Why is Stein important? It's it's like the affine varieties in the complex world, in the complex analytic. It's something like the close subvarieties of CN, close holomorphic subvarieties, okay? So when you see algebraic geometry, you're interested in, in, in subsets defined by polynomials. And here these are submanifolds defined by holomorphic functions. Okay. Well, so now let me give you the following theorem of I have a question. Yeah. So for example, P1 is maybe a holomorphically convex. Oh, what about C? Yeah, that's that's important. Yeah, that's an important remark. So P1 is homomorphically convex, but it's not a Stein because you only have constant functions, right? It's compact, so you cannot separate. But uh, actually, C and D, they are Stein. So this is a stronger, and uh, and there are examples in higher dimension of, of some a universal covert that are non-Stein. So Stein cannot have something compact inside. For example, you cannot have something Stein in a, a projective line. So you cannot have something like this. But there exists universal cover of surfaces that are like this. And so basically what I'm going to tell you next is that you can contract when you have when you are something holomorphically convex, you can contract these things and finish with something each time. 
Okay. So this is what I'm going to tell you, and this is that what can be the most knowledge. So in the I mean, you can think out of it, but but it's it's really it's not the right way. I don't know. I mean, it's really all the uh, uh, probably these ideas were in but certainly it's like that. I mean, certainly it's like you have some some weaker condition and you can contract something and make it stronger. That's that's for sure. So let X be a complex space. So then we say um, X is a holomorphically complex. You can only if there exists a proper holomorphic projective map to H time space. Okay. So basically what you can say is if you have something each time, you can blow up points and you can obtain something holomorphically convex. And you can go in the other way around. You can contract this curve so you have low up or something like a, a vibration with compact fibers and you will obtain something each time. I mean the idea is that we have a relation between polymorphic convexity and Einstein and it's it's of geometric nature. Okay? Are we good? So now let me recall a Another definition before I start with stating the main theorems. And this is also really basic. So let's consider G a group. Um, I will be a little bit sloppy. I don't, I don't want to consider torsion, but uh, anyway. So it's lower central series. Are defined as follows. So J1 is the, the same group. JK is defined inductively by taking the commutator of G and GK minus 1. And we say that G is new potent. If uh, GK is trivial for a K sufficiently, sufficiently big. Okay, so basically, what I'm saying is when you have a group, you can ask if it's abelian, right? When abelian are simple, but you can consider also extensions of abelian, and these extensions can be non trivial. So this is basically measuring how, if, if you can construct a group by extension of a billion groups. So if it is nilpotent, you can have some quotients and you can give a, an iterated extension, okay? But this can be non-abelian. And, and we, we kind of see this as a still simple group, like simple to, to work on it. And we have some, some tools to work. And also, when you have something abelian, you can work on with Hodge theory and construct some morphisms that are of, of geometric nature. So let me state the, the first theorem that I want to talk about. So this is a theorem of Katsako in, in 97 that says the following. Let X be a smooth projective variety with a nilpotent fundamental group. Then, it's universal cover. is holomorphically convex. Okay, so we can say he solved the Shafarevich conjecture 
when the fundamental group of azimuth projective variety is nilpotent. So this is the, the title, and in, in the in the talk we are interested in the Shafarevich conjecture. This is one of the first words where you can use the nilpotency. So now the title also mentioned recent developments, and this is, as you can see, quite old, 97. So now let me go to so a recent result. I'm going to say a lot of words that I haven't defined it yet. But uh, so this is due to Green, Griffiths, and Katsarko. This is past year, 2022. Um, so now we are taking projective here. We can take now something open, Sarisky open in the projective, something called quasi projective. So let X be a quasi projective manifold. Um, and there is some technicality with the proper quasi albanese map. I'm going to say a little, some words about this. And uh, an important fundamental group as well. Then, once again, the universal cover of X is holomorphically convex. Okay, so you basically they are extending this work on the on the projective case to so the quasi-projective case. And it actually, well, you have a lot of years in between, right? And you have some work that I will try to summarize in the next minutes. Um, yeah, I, I just was, uh, still... the universal cover. Uh, he was, uh, universal cover of X. Sorry. So they they divide in, in, in two steps. So the first one is constructing a, a map, something like the cartan remer and they prove that this is a proper map. And now the second point of the proof is to prove that the map they are ending, the, 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 the codomain is actually Stein. And so in the first part, they did three proofs of it. And, and we, we gave another proof so this is me with uh, with Campana this year. So let me call this theorem A. Theorem A holds if uh, X is normal quasi-projective. So we gave another proof, and we also actually extend also this to to some singular setting. So we are admitting some some singularities. So if you remember, we start with something smooth here. So we are going, we are pushing into quasi-projective and quasi-projective normal, and the techniques are um, similar but not exactly the same as there. So let me now just give you a definition of what is this quasi albanese probably you heard probably not so um so more definitions just to require that the albanese map yeah albanese. yeah it's the same so this is very important we should um have this hypothesis always this we ask also in this normal case that this is proper if not, we can find very simple counterexamples. Um, so definition is the following. So let G be a commutative algebraic group. So 
So we say that G is a quasi abelian variety. If uh, we can give G as an extension in the following way, so we have C star to the to some power, and then with A, uh, this is an abelian variety. This is a quotient of C n by a full rank lattice. So basically, when you are considering quasi-projective manifolds, you will get something open when you consider some constructions that are, let's say, canonical by integrating holomorphic forms. And you will get some C star. And we are getting something like that. So I'm being also slightly here. So now, given x, let's say normal, quasi-projective, there exists a, a, a quasi-abelian variety Morphism that is as follows. So you, you have X and you have a map. So this quasi albanese variety. And it's universal in the sense that if you have a morphism to another quasi abelian variety, it will factor through this. So it's it's very similar to the albanese morphism, just it's for the quasi-projective setting. And you, um, alpha x is called the albanese morphism, or the quasi-albanese. Let me just say albanese. It has some Some properties that we will need, and it's the following. So if you take H1 of the original variety, the, the first homology group, this is going to be the same as the H1 of the image of this albanese morphism, and this is actually the same as the quasi-albanese variety. Let's say multiple torsion. So you need to take Q coefficients. Okay? So in some in some sense, this variety is recalling the building information that you have here. So this is not recalling the, the fundamental group, but it's only recalling the H1. So that will be enough in our for our purpose. And we always assume that this is that this is proper, okay? So you can obtain as well as by integrating the holomorphic forms, as in the projective case, but I'm not sure. So this will finish the the first part, the motivation part. Then I'm going to give you some general picture. So basically, if I have time, I will tell you something about the proof of this theorem with the with Campana. But uh, I want to give you first some general picture questions. Are good? No. 
So it, it is the same as the intermediate Jacobian. Mm. I mean, for example, when you consider intermediate Jacobian, the Albanese is some particular case of that. Right? Probably you can see it like that, but it's. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really something, this quasi Albanese is going to be something like um, H1. Um, of x with uh, polymorphic forms dual modulo h1. So it's the same formula as in the as in the projective case. But uh, all, only when you integrate there is some lattice that is you obtain something like cn times modulo c to the n. So you don't get a full lattice here. And this is going to be the c star. And this is coming from the from the Hodge um, structure that comes from the, the open part. Okay, what else? So now I'm not going to talk about the proof of this general feature, but let me give you more ideas. So this is just an important case. So we know how to solve the, the Shafarevich conjecture in the in the following case. We can solve Shafarevich if the fundamental group I1 is nil potent. And as, as I told you, this is due to Katsarkov. 97, you have Green Griffith Katsarkov 22, and we did something with Campana. And so the, the main the main technique here is that when you have I1 that is not nil potent, I1 admits A mixed hot structure. So um, we'll try to explain what this is. And using this mixed hot structure, you can uh, get the result. So now the next step is when phi one of x admits a faithful reductive representation and so this is in some sense opposite so this is an important case so when you have a an algebraic group you can decompose it in some reductive part and some unipotent or let's say nilpotent part and so you this is the other extreme and so in this um, in this setting, the techniques are the following. So you have non-abelian Hodge theory. Harmonic maps. To buildings. So I'm just saying a lot of a lot of phrases that probably you don't know. It's it's not going to be important. But if, we, if you have heard this before, I want to give you an idea of what they they are using, and uh, and they also use variation of hot structure and people working on this. So it's Katsakov and Ramachandran, '98, SEU. In 24, um, then Katsakov and Jamanoi this year, and uh, Brunevard also this year. And so it's, it's the same story. So they, 
Katsarkov and Ramachandran started in the surface case. They suppose that they have a representation, a reductive representation, then they deform to obtain some variation of host structure. Then they use this to construct some harmonic map, and with this, this construct this Bremer reduction. Then SCDU extended this to, to higher dimensions in the projective case. And now, Brunebarb and then Katsarkov Yamanoi, they extended to the quasi projective setting. But they construct only the, the map. They don't prove holomorphic convexity. So they are having the help of it. And so the, the last part is the linear case. So this is when pi 1 of x admits a linear representation. Linear faithful representation and basically the, the techniques are so you are making a you are mixing the two. So this is nilpotent nilpotent techniques plus reductive techniques mm. and you you also need to use something called variation of mixed hot structure so this time you will obtain something mixed even in the projected case and this is done by Esidio Katsarkov Pantev and Ramachandran in 2012 and we are working on the on the quasi-projective setting. So this is the, the big picture. So I'm talking today about the, the important case, but we can also have more information on, the, on this faithful representation and on this linear case. But the techniques are somewhat different. So now let me give you some. Some details. Questions? Um, how <coughs> strong is this condition? So how oh. far you are from trapped with the 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 shared conjecture total? The problem is that we don't know a lot of non-linear groups so we actually know how to construct them uh, like in two families but they both satisfy Shafarevich conjecture in that case so this is exactly the problem that I was telling you in my PhD thesis we were trying to search groups that are not linear but this is very difficult but Nina is really an expert on trying to compute fundamental groups and it's, it's really difficult to get something non-linear and it's so we don't know. That's that's really the answer. So all the examples that we know, or most of them, they are known to be linear, or in the few cases that are non-linear, they are known to to satisfy Shapovalov's condition. Thank you. Didn't you say that if you drop the condition of the quasi one is going to have to be proper? Yeah. Uh, then, then you get the counter example. This is in the projective setting. So the projective setting is very difficult to to get non-linear to get Contraexample. So we don't know a contraexample in the projective smooth. Okay. But if, if you are in the quasi-projective, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's yeah, it's really simple. For example, if you get C2 minus one point minus zero, let's say. So this is not holomorphically convex and it's simply connected. Because every function will extend through zero. Right? And uh, it, the universal coverage itself. So you, you, you obtain really, I mean, if you take the quasi one essay, it's, it's not going to be proper if it's itself. Okay. And it's very, if you take an abelian variety and you remove points, that's also a counterexample. Then you, you really need to ask some proper of this. I mean, the possibility fails really easily. But in 
there. Okay, so now let me give you something about code structure. Should I should I give? Yeah, probably I will skip this. I, I prepared something for code, code structure for the graduate students, but I, I think I'm skipping the topic. So now let me tell you some details. So we have the following theorem of Morgan in Hein. That says the following. Um, so let X be a quasi-projective variety. With uh, an important fundamental group, then this I one of x admits a mixed hot structure. It's actually a pro mixed hot structure, so it's a limit of mixed hot structure. So what is the meaning of this? If you remember these Taylor varieties or projective varieties, when you take the cohomology, you can decompose them as a, as a sum, right? This is the sum of H e Q with E plus Q equals K, right? And now, a mixed hot structure is something that has two filtrations. So F and W, and when you when you take the quotient by this filtration, this is going to be a hot structure of degree i. So you make successive quotients, and each part of this will be like this. And you have some properties. But it's going to be mixed. Like I was telling you, in the important groups, these are like extensions of abelian groups. Now, mixed hot structures is like an extension of uh, of these things, you know, these pure hot structures. Okay. So and with this, what's the condition of pi one here, or is there some? With pi one, is potent. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. And what, what do we what do we need this? So we use the following theorem of Hein Arapura. So the first is proved in in ninety eight by Hein. Oh, I'm I'm forgetting something. So where let me put inside the theorem. And so there exists. A Lie algebra controlling this pi one. So you can have a a morphism between well a map between this pi one and some Lie algebra. And the Lie algebra will have some uh, mixed hot structure, and then you are actually take the ex X exponential function, and this will give you some growth. It's like in the case of Lie groups, you take the the Lie algebra associated to it, right? And so we have something like that. We have a Lie algebra controlling this important group, and you have sometimes it's easier to work on this Lie algebra, and that's what I'm going to use here. So we have a theorem of Hein and of Arapura, Dinka, Hein. That is going to to tell you the following, and this is really the main this important step that we use to prove this with with Frederick. Um, I will I will explain more. So we will consider a map that I will call delta, and this is. Defined from this 
created pieces of the mixed hot structure on H2. And this is going to go to the free, this is denoting free Lie algebra to the graded part of H1 um, and then the graded pieces of the Lie algebra, let me call L of X, L of X controlling this nilpotent fundamental group is given as the free Lie algebra generated by H1 and the relations are the image of this delta 2. Okay, so it's, you know, this is the, the really technical point, so let me go slowly. So I was telling you, we have some Lie algebra controlling this fundamental group, right? And so what Hein, Karapura, Dinka, and Richard tell us is that here x is, an, as in the theorem with Frederick, X is normal, quasi projective, let's say probably with phi one of X in important, so I'm telling you this Lie algebra controls this nilpotent group. But actually, this Lie algebra can be obtained by H1, oh, this is X, by H1 and H2, and that's all. So basically, you can obtain some non abelian information, some these Disney potent extensions. They are controlled by H1 and by H2. So if, if you think in, in cohomology, You have something, you have a map, right? You have from H1 of X, and you make cup product. Probably let me write like tensor here. This is simply cup product. You are going to be in H2. And you want to take the kernel of this, of this map. What this theorem is telling you is that if you know H1 and the kernel of this, and here, if you dualize, this is the image, you, you know how to construct this Lie algebra. And that's all. And now, what is the important part about the mixed hot structure? Is that the mixed hot structure um, for a normal quasi-projective variety looks like a smooth quasi projective. So I, I don't want to give more details, but H1 can have weight 0, 1, or 2, and 0 is coming from the singularities. But in the normal case, H1 will have only weights 1 and 2. And so the relations are of, of a very special type. And so when you consider something that it's normal quasi projective, the things that are coming from the singularities in H2, they will not, um, not affect this Lie algebra. And now, I was telling you that the H1 of X is the same as the H1 of the Alban essay. And so now, what you have to prove is that this, the image of X2 is also the same in the Alban essay. So you have, um, yeah, no, I don't want to give more details. So you have something controlling the nilpotent groups upstairs and the nilpotent groups downstairs. 
And if you show that they are the same, you have the Albanese map. And the universal cover of the Albanese map is C to the N. And that's Stein. So you have something like this. You have something X, and this is the Albanese variety. And here you have the quasi Albanese. And now, here you have C to the power N. And this is a Stein. And if you show that this thing controlling the pi one are the same for the image, not for this Albanese, but for the image, you can obtain a universal cover here. And you will obtain a map that is proper. And then you can argue something like, oh, this is a, a subset of something Stein, and that's Stein. And this is proper? Well, this is telling you by the Kahn Remer that this is holomorphically convex. And so basically, the, the fundamental group is controlling the fullback to the universal cover. And the fundamental group is controlled by this algebra. And so if you show that the algebras are the same, well, the fundamental groups are the same, at least in this nilpotent case. And so you can construct some map and you can show holomorphic convexity. You can prove the Schiaparelli's conjecture in this case. <laughs>